and thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing this seminar and for inviting me to speak. It's a great pleasure. As you already said, I'm going to talk about sharp Y laws for shooting operators on uh, manifolds with rough potentials. And this is joint work with Julien Sabin from Paris OC. And so let me remind you, oops, what's going on? like this. Okay, let me remind you um, before we come to the talk, uh, before we come to the, the case of shooting operators, which will be the main topic of the talk, let me remind you of the case of just the ordinary Laplacian. So these are all um, very well-known results. Let's go through them. In the whole um, talk, I will be assuming that M is a three-dimensional compact C4 Riemannian manifold without boundary. Let me explain that a little bit better. So um, no boundary is one of the important assumptions. We can do the things, the local things that we have can be done even if there's a boundary, but I mean, then you have to stay away from the boundary. The, uh, something, somebody unmuted me. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, can hear you. Can you? Okay. Somehow I was muted, but I am muted myself. Anyway, let's continue. So uh, I was saying that we have a three-dimensionality assumption. Um, obviously, we would want to uh, get rid of this eventually. Um, I think everything should be valid in general dimensions, but there are some special identities that uh, force us at the moment to do this. And then finally, the C4 assumption, I mean, that should should just say that we are not over excessive in what we need in the regularity on the underlying manifold. I think one can perhaps with more work and in particular if we would understand this three-dimensionality assumption better, we could get down to C2 or even C11 manifolds, which would probably be rather optimal. But anyway, what I'm saying is uh, already interesting, I hope, for C infinity manifolds. So let's not worry too much about that in the following of the talk. All right, and so to set up the notation, we have the Laplacian with the sign convention we learned in calculus. Then um, this has obviously a discrete spectrum which accumulates at plus infinity only, and we denote by this one um, of minus Laplace less or equal than lambda, the spectral projection to eigenvalues less or equal than lambda. So this is just a finite sum of eigenfunctions <laughs> involves just a finite sum of eigenfunctions. In particular, it has an integral kernel, which I denote uh, by uh, this symbol, and mostly will be interested in the on diagonal, namely where x is equal to y. And then in particular, if you integrate this on diagonal spectral function over the manifold, then what you get is the number, the total number of eigenvalues less or equal than lambda, counting multiplicities of your Laplace Beltrami operator. Okay? And we'll be interested in statements about the large lambda behavior of this quantity. And these large um, lambda behaviors, they, they typically go under the name of Weyl's law. And I want to distinguish four different versions of this law, which will all play a um, uh, role in, in the following of this talk. So the simplest uh, version is what I want to call for this talk, the integrated while law, um, which simply gives the asymptotics to leading order of this total number of eigenvalues. It's lambda to the three halves. There's a certain uh, constant and there's the volume of the manifold. And by when I'm just saying integrated while law, I mean that we just have a little O remainder, no quantitative estimate on that. That was proved by a while, at least in for subsets of Euclidean space more than 100 years ago. And then about 20 years later, Kahleman showed that actually a pointwise version of this law holds. <laughs> Oops. Namely, the spectral function on the diagonal satisfies the, the same 
lambda to the three halves divided by constant plus the little o remainder, and this is uniform in x. So that's stronger than the integrated while law because you get this by integration. Actually, one has to be a little bit careful uh, when one is in Euclidean space about the, the boundary, but I mean, that's, that can be done. All right, and then the, this result of Kalimann was generalized to the setting of manifolds of any dimension by Minak, Shisundaraman, and Pleyel in 1949. And then in the 50s, people started to wonder what one can say about these remainder terms. Can one do anything better than the little o? In fact, Courant already in 1912 had an estimate in the, for the integrated while laws, which was off by logarithm. But the question was whether one can get the sharp order, uh, namely capital O of lambda. And this can be done. And there were two approaches, uh, one put forward by Levitan in 1952, and another one by Avakumovich in 1952 and 1956. And the approach of Levitan is based on the wave equation and some Fourier Tauberian theorems. And this was the approach that has dominated most of the analysis in the years afterwards. In particular, once people have understood the capital O lambda estimates, they have gone on to find for certain manifolds little o estimates. But I will not speak about those in my talk. Right, because I should perhaps say the name sharp by law refers to the fact that in the class of all Riemannian manifolds, you cannot improve over the capital O remainder. For instance, the round sphere or more generally any Sol manifold um, are counterexamples or show that this capital O estimate is sharp. All right. And so, as I was saying, this uh, Levitan's approach um, has become the dominant one. The other approach of Avakumo, which um, has not found a lot of application in the literature, and in some sense, in this talk, I want to uh, advertise this approach of Avakumo, which this will play a big role for us. Okay, I will show that this is particularly well suited in low regularity situations. So the question I want to ask today is what happens with these while laws, the four different versions that we had on the previous slide, what happens if we consider minus Laplacian plus V instead of just the minus Laplacian? So I want to add a potential V. And if V is a nice function, I don't want to be more specific at this point, then the answer is just nothing happens. It's just the same as before. Um, one way to see this, there, there might be many ways to see this, is you write the whole thing as a semi-classical problem, which means nothing else than that you divide through by one over lambda, the whole thing. You recognize, I mean, then you, you call the, the number that appears in front of the Laplacian, you call that h squared, and you see that in front of the v there's an h squared. Now, semi-classic tells us that every derivative should have an, an h, so that's fine here, and this is the minus one, so the principal symbol is just minus h squared Laplacian minus one. This h squared v is a lower order term, so that affects semi-classics only to a relative order h squared. Since we're talking about the counting function, we cannot expect anything better than a relative order of h, right, and so therefore we simply don't see this thing in our asymptotics, okay? But the situation is different or potentially different if I have rough V, right? If I have a potential such that this semi-classical argument, the semi-classical calculus that's implicit over there is not available anymore. And so the particular class of potentials that I'm gonna use are Cato class potentials. And I'm recalling the definition of the Cato class here. So this is the, the potential V. You integrate it against the fundamental solution of the Laplacian. That's one over the distance, uh, geodesic distance between X and Y. Right in Euclidean space, this would be just one over X minus Y. And we do this integral over a region where mm, this distance is smaller than a certain epsilon. Then you soup over x and you say that, so uniformly in x, this integral should go to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, that's called the Cato class. And now I guess at this point, you will have 
two, at least two questions. The first one is, why do I care about rough V? And the second, if I care about rough V, why do I care about the Cartan class? Let me try to answer these two questions and motivate the, um, the problem that we're doing. So our, our motivation, the reason why Julia and I started to look at this problem came from a mini course that SOG delivered at the Mittag Leffler Institute in 2019. And then there appeared a paper by Blair, Sear, and Sorg, and by Wong and Sorg uh, just uh, a month ago or so, where they really raised the question as it's stated there, and they prove um, several nice and interesting results. And our question was whether we can understand them, whether we can recover them, and perhaps even um, generalize them and improve them. Um, it's the fact that you have singular potentials in uh, many problems in mathematical physics is well known. I mean, think about the, the Coulomb potential. And also, uh, some of you might know that in the analysis of these problems, sometimes the sharp Y law, pointwise Y laws play an important role. Okay, I will not uh, go in, in more details at this point. Um, another motivation uh, is comes from nonlinear analysis. This is sort of, it's often when you do nonlinear analysis, you're in sort of a bootstrap situation. You know something and then you want to do something else in order to improve the something that you knew at the beginning. And in quite a number of problems, what you have to do in this step is do semi-classical analysis with low regularity. Okay, and so once you can do semi classics with no low regularity, then you can feed that back into some more complicated nonlinear problem and you learn something. All right, and I guess the last motivation I have is that at least for us, we, we found some, some results that we found um, surprising that we didn't expect when we started to look at this. Anyway, so, so that's about rough V. Now, why am I talking about Carter class V? I personally have not worked with Carter class before. Um, I mean, the, the reason why what I had understood is that people care about the Carter class is because it's uh, scaling critical. If you, you see, I mean, if you, you scale the potential locally, it just scales just like the Laplacian, like a one over length squared. So it's a critical class and it's uh, almost optimal for question like self adjointness. Perhaps a more classical class of potentials there would be L three halves potential. They are also scaling critical, also almost optimal for self adjointness. But now there is one important point about the Carter class, which is not true for L three halves. And that is that eigenfunctions for Schrodinger operators with Carter class potentials are bounded. Okay, so it's easy to find examples of potentials in L three halves, say, um, where eigenfunctions have singularities. On the other hand, as I said, for, for Carter class, we have boundedness. And whenever you want to talk about pointwise while laws, well, you better have bounded eigenfunctions because otherwise there is no way to, to even, I mean, make sense of the first term. And we want to talk about the second term, so to speak. All right, and then I guess one of the motivations that we do have is we uh, want to advertise this method of Abakumovich, which um, we think deserves to be more widely known. So this is him. This is Vojislav Abakumovich, who lived from 1910 to 1990, uh, spent part of his life in former Yugoslavia and uh, the second part in, in Germany. For the talk, there will be uh, three papers in particular relevant for us. Um, you see the last two are about eigenvalue problems. The first one is about uh, Tauberian theorems. Some of the, the, the fun that uh, Julien Sabin and I had when, when working on this project was that it was sort of an archaeological task. You see, I mean, these papers are published in German and more often than not, these papers refer back to some other papers in Serbian and which neither Julien nor I speak. And so it was fun to, to really discover what was going on there. Um, we looked at, here's a list of, of the PhD students. Um, we looked at many of these papers. There are um, um, 
quite a number of papers on related subjects. A number of them are in Serbian, the other in German, and then a lot of them have references to unpublished work or lecture notes of Abakumovic. So all this, I think, contributed to the fact that this approach is not more widely known. And if you look at this paper, for instance, this is a really great paper, but the length is two pages. And so that, just to give you a flavor of this, this has lots of references to earlier results and that one can do something like there and then do something. And so we try to, to uh, uncover all of this. Let's see whether we succeeded. So let me uh, come now to the statement of the main results. Um, the first one concerns the pointwise vital law for cartoclast potentials. So the statement is you have your Schrodinger operator on this manifold, as I said before, three dimensional, no boundary, uh, C4 smooth. And the statement is the pointwise vital law with a little o remainder remains valid for cartoclast potentials. This is uniformly in X. Okay, now if I um, Tell, told you this result, it's perhaps you'd say, yes, okay, so what? But I think the story becomes now interesting, more interesting when we um, try to dig deeper and when we try to dig into the, the size of this remainder term. All right. And so the first example that we have here is in general, you cannot replace the little o remainder by a capital O remainder. And there's a, a simple example. Essentially, you just take one over x to the two minus eta. Eta is a parameter between zero and one. Okay, so you have a singularity at a point. And then you look at the spectral function at a geodesic distance, one over square root of lambda from this uh, singularity. And what you find is, well, there's the wild term, the first term, that's no surprise, but then there's a correction and this has order lambda to the three minus eta over two, I remind you eta is a number that can be arbitrarily close to zero. So that thing says that you cannot do better, at least algebraically better than the little o lambda to the three halves. And interestingly, what we see there is that on the scale one over square root of lambda, there is a profile function psi that comes out. It's first of all, it's, it's positive. So there actually is a correction and then you can, I mean, this function is rather explicit. You can compute, for instance, its, its large um, uh, y behavior. It's a funny function. You can plot it. It's monotone, but it's not convex. It has some hidden oscillations that you, you somehow still see there. Um, it's also not completely clear where this function comes from we'll have a more or less explicit integral representation for it. But I mean, it's not really a semi-classical effect and it's not a spectral effect either, right? I mean, you semi-classical effect is perhaps the, the first thing you would Im imagine. A spectral effect, that's something like what you have in the Scott correction, but it's none of that. Okay, so there's this correction term and which says that in general, we cannot do better than, than the little o remainder in the Carto class, right? This function belongs to the Carto class. Now, if we go on, you might still ask, well, for which class of potentials is it then true that you have the capital O remainder? Uh, sorry, capital O lambda remainder, right? The sharp, the best possible remainder. And so we give a sufficient condition for that that's looks very much like the Cato class. It's just that you have to integrate here against the fundamental solution squared. Okay, so you integrate the potential against the square of the fundamental solution over ball of radius epsilon, some arbitrary epsilon. And if this is finite uniformly in X, then you have the sharp pointwise y law. This is a rather optimal condition um, it's, you see that the, the, the breakdown of this condition occurs exactly at this power of the singularity eta equal to one that we, we saw on the previous slide. If you prefer to talk about LP conditions, then you see that this condition, 
the, write this uh, with a fundamental solution squared, that this condition is satisfied if the potential is an LP with P greater than three. On the other hand, if we go back to the example before, we see that for every P smaller than three, there's such a eta such that this potential from the example belongs to LP. So what I'm trying to say is L3 is the, the boundary between having a sharp pointwise while law and having violations of the sharp pointwise while law. Okay. And then finally, there's another result um, which now concerns the integrated while law. See what you could think. So what I was just telling you is that the, the um, sharp pointwise while law might fail for Cartor class potential. So you might think that then the integrated version could also fail, but actually no. So for the integrated while law, we do have the lambda, the O lambda remainder, just like for the Laplacian. And not only that, we're even able to allow, in addition to a Cartor class, uh, L3 halves potential. I should at this point uh, perhaps emphasize that neither the Cartor class is contained in L3 halves, nor L3 halves is contained in the Cartor class. So um, it's really taking the sum as a non-trivial property. Okay. So this means that even if we have this pointwise um, violation, when we integrate it, it does not affect. So this violation cannot happen at too many points at the same time, so to speak. The result here in this uh, sharp integrated while law was proved, as I said, about a month ago by Wang and Sock, but only for Cartor class potentials. The, the fact that one can even allow the L3 have summon is new. All right, so these were, were essentially the results that I wanted to present. So on the one hand, the, the, the little O bound, little O of lambda to the three halves is true for any Cartor class potential. And then pointwise, you have to distinguish um, whether you do the integrated, sorry, Concerning the, the capital O of lambda remainder, you have to distinguish whether you do pointwise or integrated. Integrated, it remains valid. Pointwise, it might be violated and you need this uh, extra condition if you want to ensure. All right. So let me um, tell you a little bit before digging into the details about how we prove this and how our proof which follows these ideas of our Kumo, which is different from this traditional approach going back to Levitan. So there are two essential ingredients. The first one is you find parametrics estimates for nice function of your operator. And the second thing is you do a proof of Tobarian theorem. So, so far that's the, the standard approach. The interesting point here is the parametrics that we're using. So first of all, this is a resolvent to the minus two. The two is just dictated by the dimension. The important thing here is that you take the resolvent plus lambda with lambda large positive. So this means you walk away from the spectrum, go towards minus infinity in the spectrum. This is the elliptic region. That's the region we like, right? Where, where you have, where everything is positive. Um, and then the Tiberian theorem we use is one for the Steeltjes tr transform. That's simply because this thing here is a Steeltjes transform of the spectrum measure. Okay, but I mean, one, one should be careful. I mean, in this Tiberian theorem, we also have the asymptotics then at the, the lambda, I mean, in the spectrum going to minus infinity. All right, now, why am I emphasizing these points? Uh, is for the, um, I mean, usually people following Levitan and then in particular the work of Hermanda, uh, they followed the, the wave propagators. This is stuff that is highly oscillatory. You have to worry about phases. Similarly, when a, a method proposed by Agamon and then, I mean, push to the optimal um, capital of lambda estimate by Metivier, this method uses, the important thing here is, uses the, the operator close to the spectrum. 
right? So this is a minus lambda here. And then, I mean, because you don't want to hit an eigenvalue, you add a plus i epsilon. But this is a very different thing. Here we go away from the spectrum. Here we are as close as we can at the spectrum. All right, so these, these wave propagators and the uh, uh, resolvent close to the spectrum, um, <clears throat> those have harder parametrics estimate simply because you need to take care uh, of oscillations. Um, on the other hand, they lead to somewhat simpler Tauberian theorems. So in some sense, we're, we're moving the difficulty from one place to another place. But the point is that these Tauberian theorems, they are very, very general um, results. It's the, the, the the difficulty is sort of a little bit more compartmentalized and um, there are also many previously known results on these Tauberian theorems that one can use or try to extend. As I said, um, Abakumovic's uh, strategy is, well, we're following essentially his strategy, at least what I described was the, the thing that he used for V equal to zero. Then a PhD student of Avokumovic, Bojanic, extended this to bounded potentials in Euclidean space. And um, we are very much influenced by the approach, but we do have to work harder. And that's because of two reasons. So when we look at, so we look th at the same parametrics at the, the resolvent squared, mm, but there will be additional terms, terms that cannot be dealt with with Avakumovic's method or Bojanic's method. Okay. Um, see, Bojanic works with bounded potentials. For bounded potentials, we know, for instance, from our main results, that there is no violation of the pointwise while law. So he cannot see these terms, the terms that cause the problems. Right. And so we need to isolate them. And then these terms that we isolate, they actually live at the highest order in the Tauberian theorems. So we actually need to revisit all these proofs of the Tauberian theorems and, and find a, a more general version for those. Rupert, there is yes. a question in the, in the chat okay. from uh, Bernard Alpha. He's asking uh, if dimension three is important so far in the approach and what role it plays. Um, I will, that comes, I think, only at the last slide. I try to, to explain or at least show you the place where we use it. Um, and, and then we, it's perhaps better to, to wait with that question until we are at this point, but it will take some time. Thanks for the question. Um, perhaps one thing I should, I should emphasize here is, I mean, we chose or, uh, to work with the, pa the the square of the resolvent, I think morally this is the same as if you would work with the heat kernel. Okay, and then you would prove a Tauberian theorem for the Laplace transform, not for the Stieltjes transform. And um, that's related to this multidimensionality issue, uh, which I will um, come back to at the end of the talk. All right, so. There was a little bit of general overview, mostly directed at people who have previous knowledge with these techniques. But now let me go back to the beginning. Let me start with the textbook proof of how you prove Weil's law using Tauberian theorems. That's the, the idea of Kalaman. Okay. And I do it in parallel with the heat kernel and with the resolvent squared, just because, I mean, most of you have probably seen the heat kernel proof before. The resolvent proof is really the same thing, but it's the one that we will be using later on. All right, so the, the, the observation is simply that the heat kernel or the, the, the diagonal element of the resolvent squared is just a Laplace, or a Stieltjes transform of the, the spectral function. Okay, so, but for these functions, for the heat kernel of, or the square of the resolvent, it's rather easy to get leading order parametrics estimates. You essentially plug in the Euclidean guy in, in geodesic normal coordinates, and that's what you get. Okay, so point wise, you see that the heat kernel behaves like four pi t to the minus three halves, or a corresponding result for the resolvent square. 
Okay, so the asymptotics for the Laplace for steel chest transform is um, under control. The next thing is you now go to a, a Tauberian theorem of Hardy and Littlewood, and this uh, Tauberian theorem says that if you know the asymptotics of, say, the Laplace or the steel chest transform, and in addition you have a Tauberian condition, the condi Tauberian condition being here a, a positivity of a measure, all right, so this means that this function is increasing, the spectral function is increasing in lambda, then you get from the asymptotics of the transform back to the asymptotics of the measure. So combining the parametrics estimates with the Tiberian, Tiberian uh, theorems, you get now the leading order asymptotics, the pointwise value. All right, I should perhaps mention just a historical remark that this Tiberian theorem of Hardy Littlewood had originally a very long and complicated proof and then a very simple one um, based on the Warstras approximation theorem was found by Karamata and often this Tiberian theorem is actually called the Karamata Tiberian theorem. The relation to our talk is that Karamata was the PhD advisor of Avakumovic. All right, so that's where we are concerning the leading term. So the question is now, how can we get subleading terms? Can we improve this little o, relative little o remainder to something better? And then obviously the first thing you want to try is you would like to improve the parametrics estimates. You would want to improve the little o of lambda here or there. Well, for the parametrics estimates, you can do this. That's well known. But the problem is that uh, you cannot make the Tiberian theorem work anymore. OK, so I mean, the natural thing is you apply the Tiberian theorem to the dis difference between the, the true function and the, the leading order parametrics. But then this positivity condition is no longer satisfied and you cannot conclude. And in fact, there's a theorem in Tiberian uh, theory due to Freud, which says that the best error in this particular si situation, the best error you can get for the parametrics gives you nothing else than a relative one over log lambda error in the, in the, for the spectral function. So can that's... Put, there is another question. Can mm -hmm. I interrupt you now? Yeah, okay. So it's from Dima Jacobson. He's asking if for positivity you need to have x equal y in the spectral function. Um, the question is yes or no. So it can be, I mean, essentially, if you just apply the, the standard theorems, then the answer is yes. But with some tweaking, I think you also get the, the, the little o on the off time. And I mean, that's, that's done in these papers by Ava Kumovic, but, um, but uh, I will not discuss this in this talk. It's an interesting question, yes. All right, so now we are at this point where we see the first uh, of two crucial insights of Ava Kumovic. So what he says is that, uh, uh, the power-like remainder of the parametrics estimate doesn't help us. But if we have an exponentially small remainder, either for the heat kernel or for the resolvent squared, then we do get the sharp remainder. Okay? And his um, approach is now based on what's called complex Tiberian theorems. These are theorems that don't consider the Laplace or steel chest transform only along real values of the Laplace transform parameters, but for complex values. Okay, and somehow the fact that you have an exponentially small remainder allows you to make an analytic continuation. All right, and so these actually in Euclidean space, these uh, exponentially small remainders are well known. And um, using those Avakumovic in 1952, that's the two page paper, he could prove that you have the, the, the lambda, the while term plus uh, error lambda uh, and then multiplied by one over the distance. Okay, so that's a theorem that's more interesting methodologically um, 
you get it via Lebitan's approach, you get it immediately by finite speed of propagation and some first order Fourier Tauberian theorems. However, the fact is that you also get it through the heat kernel techniques. I think that's an interesting observation. All right. So that settles the question in Euclidean space because in Euclidean space, there's the leading term and at least when you're away from the boundary, there's nothing else. Everything else is exponentially small. Now, how about manifolds? So manifolds, that's no longer true. The, the difference to the wild term is not exponentially small. There are actually coefficients and they, they are well known and well computed. Okay, so there is here a, a T correction and a one over lambda correction there. Now the second crucial insight of Abakumovich, that's in his, in the 1956 paper, is that these terms, the, the ones that are not the wild term, but those that are not exponentially small, those terms have a special structure. They themselves are Stilchis transforms of functions which satisfy, so it's a Stilchis transform, of a function which satisfies a favorable bound, right? So the, they are as good as they have the accuracy that you want to prove. So therefore they don't bother you, okay? So to summarize, Akumovich has two important insights. First, exponentially small terms are good. And secondly, the other terms should be recognized as terms which are themselves transforms satisfying the bounds that we want. And then once you have these two ingredients, then the, the bounds are followed by, by this, the following Tiberian theorem. So let me, let me read the, start here reading at the end. Okay, so there is a sum of three terms and you show that this is capital O of lambda. The term that you're really interested in is the B1 term. Okay, that's the increasing term. Then there's the B naught lambda to the three halves term. That's the leading term, the one you want to extract. So you, the conclusion you want to have at the end is the B1 is equal to minus B naught lambda to the three halves. That will be the wild term. Okay. Now, um, the B2 term, from about this term, you know originally that it's capital O of lambda. And the conclusion is that the whole thing is capital O lambda. So the B2 term somehow does not bother you. Why do you need the B2 term? Well, only with the B2 term is this steel chest transform exponentially small. Let me say it again. It's a little bit complicated if you see it for the first time. The B1 is the interesting thing. You have an exponentially small remainder after you've subtracted the term B2, which is of this uh, steel chest form. All right, concerning the B, okay, let me not go into this. So, so B1, as I said, that's a spectral function. B0, that's simply a constant, right? So that's the wild term. There's this additional assumption, but if B is a constant, this is a triviality. And B2 was this extra term that we found that contains all the corrections due to the geometry, which are not exponentially small. All right. So that's uh, using this Tiberian theorem. I hope you agree that we, we immediately get this sharp pointwise while law um, of Avakumovich and Leviton. Let me make two remarks. The first one goes into this direction that I'm, I'm heading with the, the multidimensionality and so on. So remember, what I told you is that the square of the resolvent on the diagonal can be written as wild term plus steel chest transform plus exponentially small. And the steel chest transform here is natural because this is the steel chest transform of the spectral measure. Now the question is, is it true when you do it for the heat kernel that it's the heat, the heat kernel is the wild term plus exponentially small plus now the Laplace transform of a function which satisfies this nice bound. Okay, so the second property, this question, this, this line here, whoops, 
this uh, representation formula for the heat kernel, that's a stronger statement than the one for the square of the resolvent that you just get because you get the, the uh, steel just transformed by integrating up the heat kernel with respect to time. Okay, so therefore it's a stronger, would be a stronger property if um, there would be such a function R tilde. And if there's such a function R tilde, then it's actually equal to the function R, perhaps up to a factor of two. All right, now there's a footnote in Avakumovich's paper, which seems to suggest that the answer to this question is yes. But we do not know how to prove it. We have the suspicion that if we can answer this affirmatively, then we will be able to extend it to, to higher dimensions. Okay, so there will be some special property of the resolvent kernel as opposed to the heat kernel that enters here the, this, uh, rec this, this function R. And we come to that later. Now, just a, a little two, two smaller remarks. Um, one is the fact that we work with the power two of the resolvents that's from, from this paper with Julien Sabin. Avakumovich himself works with a difference of first powers of resolvents. So you see morally a difference of two powers, uh, sorry, a, a difference of two first powers of resolvents is kind of like a second power and by the resolvent identity, but then there's some additional stuff you do by renormalizing with the zero eigenvalue. So we found it much more clean not to, to work directly with the second power, but it's, uh, it's a technical difference. And then I should say concerning this Tiberian theorem, right, here it is again, um, we only needed, or Avakumovich only needed the case where B naught is a constant. And however, in the, my work with Julien, we do need the version that's stated here where B naught satisfies some almost monotonicity condition, right? Monotonicity would be that B naught is greater than, I mean, at V squared is greater than B naught of U squared. This condition says that it's not far off from being monotone. And that actually requires quite a bit of work. Mm. The fact that we need it comes from these extra terms that I mentioned, right? That we see that these previous guys have not seen. Um, in the proof of this more general versions, we actually were lucky that we could take some ideas of the this third paper of Avakumovich that I mentioned, the one on Tiberian theorems. And then the idea is to, to reduce everything to another Tiberian theorem by Ingham Karamata. So that requires quite a bit of work, but um, it's kind of separate from the spectral theory context. And I don't want to uh, comment on this uh, anymore. Rupert, there's another question from yes. Lotfi Ermi. He's asking if the first term in the pointwise correction for heat trace, uh, if it is an incomplete gamma-like term. Um, I don't think so. I would not recognize it as such. Um, Thank you. It's, it's kind of related to some inverse steel chest transform of something. But I mean, as I, as I said, I mean, I think it's, um, it, it, it would be interesting to explore this term in, in greater detail. Thanks, yeah. All right, so now we are at the, the technical um, part of the proof. This is the, the sort of the technical main slide doesn't get much worse than that. Let me try to explain what's, what's going on here. Okay. And then I'll spend perhaps two more slides with explaining some ingredients of the proof and then I'll be done. Okay. So what's this about? So this is, oops, the second power, nah, doesn't work. The second power of the resolvent on the diagonal. That's the guy we want to make, get an estimate for. Here, is the while term. That's the first thing here. And now the interesting stuff comes here and there. Remember the two ideas of Avakumovich. The first idea is that exponentially small errors are fine. That's what's on the right side. And the second idea of Avakumovich is that terms that are still just transforms of nice functions are fine. Okay, so R V, 
is a nice function. By nice function, I mean that this is capital O of T. The bad news is that this first term is not a nice function. CR is bounded by one. Let's ignore the V dependence for the moment. That's bounded by a constant, but then it's multiplied by T to the three halves. So that's the term, this R V zero epsilon. That's the term that um, is the additional term. That's a new term that we found that is not present in our Kumovich or Bojanic's work. This is the term that comes due to the singularities or the roughness of the potential. Okay, so, well, as I said, we still know something about uh, this term. Well, so it's bounded by a constant. So at least, so if you plug in a constant here, then it's the same order of while. So it's not worse than while. And then importantly, this term has some, again, almost monotonicity property, right? So it, it, this says that if T and T prime are not too far apart, then this thing is not too big. So this extra condition is what essentially saves the day. All right, so, um, and then there's a, an additional parameter epsilon, which I ask you to ignore for the next 30 seconds. And then we, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then you can forget it again. Okay, but so we have the, the decomposition of the square of the resolvent. Good. So now we apply the same Tiberian theorem that I displayed before in this generalized form where there is now the B naught term. Let me go back. Here, see, that's the B naught term. That's the one where we want to get the while term out. Where this term is not only a constant, it's a constant for Abakumovich, but it's no longer a constant for us, but it does satisfy this almost monotonicity condition. And then if you have something like this and you can apply the, the Tiberian theorem, the good term, this one, which is already capital O of uh, T of lambda, this you can just subsume in the error. And what you get is that the, the spectral function is given by Weil plus the additional term. I remind you the additional term is lambda to the three halves times, times something bounded. So initially it looks like this term competes against Weil. We will see that this term is a little bit smaller, but at least you have to treat it in the proof like a main term. All right, so now let's, uh, what I'm saying next is that this corollary implies more or less immediately our main results. So let me tell you this, for instance, for the, for the pointwise while law, right? For the pointwise while law, you just, um, well, you apply this bound, you divide by lambda to the three halves, right? We just wanna get a little o of lambda to the three halves remainder. So then the right side, which depends on this epsilon parameter that I haven't told you about, disappears, right? You divide by lambda to three halves, let lambda go to infinity. So that's gone. The only thing that remain, remains is this additional term. But now we go back and now we recall that there is a parameter epsilon in the game. And the, when we let, the point is when we let epsilon go to zero, then this thing goes to zero. So what is this K epsilon? If you remember the Cato class, the Cato class condition was that some quantity goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So that K epsilon is exactly that thing that appears in the Cato class condition. And by definition of the Cato class, this thing goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So recalling that you have this epsilon parameter, we immediately get the pointwise while law for Cato class potentials from this corollary. And to get the, you know, the, the sharp remainder, the, the capital O of lambda remainder under this stronger condition on V that follows simply by analyzing this term in a little bit more detail. And similarly, the, uh, the integrated version follows by integrating this term and analyzing this in detail. So let's forget Tiberian stuff. Um, let's forget the main results. Let's just focus on this proposition. This is the proposition we want to prove. I have it again on the next slide, right? The square of the resolvent, we want to decompose it in a while term, exponentially small terms, 
plus steel chest transforms of good terms or almost good terms. So the way you do this, you use a parametrics for the resolvent. And what we do is the most obvious thing, we take the a V independent parametrics. So what this means is we just take the Euclidean Green's function, right, that's the, the Yukawa potential, um, where we just replace the, the Euclidean distance x minus y by the geodesic distance. And we do this in geodesic normal coordinates around a fixed point. There's a point, a, a factor of u naught there, which comes from the volume element. Those of you who've done such a geometric a parametrics construction have seen this term, otherwise don't worry about it. And then there's a cutoff because everything just works locally. That's, and that's the cutoff where we put in this epsilon parameter, okay? And then you, you introduce the, the, the difference between the guy you like, you want to have, and the parametrics that you do have, and then you introduce a number r, which quantifies by how much this error fails to be uh, a solution. I mean, or just quantifies the error. And then again, this is a standard procedure for this function gamma, you find an integral equation, right? So that's essentially just the resolvent identity. That's, it's nothing, nothing complicated. So it says gamma, the integral kernel is given by, so you have a term which is independent of gamma, and then you have a term which does involve gamma and then is multiplied by r. Okay, so that's all pretty standard. And once you have this, you try to solve this equation just by iteration. And not very surprisingly, if lambda epsilon squared is large enough, so it's dimensionless, and if epsilon is small enough, this means here compared to the Carter class condition, then you can solve this integral equation just by iteration and you get an, an expression for, the, for this error gamma, okay? And so perhaps I should emphasize that. So why am I interested in gamma? Well, the parametrics term will give me the wild term. So the parametrics minus the true term, right? That's this difference here. That should give rise to the steel chest terms plus the exponentially small error. Okay, so while is gone now, we're interesting in finding exponentially small errors plus the steel chest terms. Okay, so here it is again. I set this error I can write as a, as a convergent series of terms depending on n, which are given just by iterating these, um, the t was the parametrics and r lambda was this error term. And as I said, we want to decompose it as, let me start, exponentially small term, term with a special structure, and this additional term that I've been talking about. Let me start with the additional term. Where does this come from? See this remainder, when you go back, that was the remainder when you apply the, the Schrodinger operator to the, the difference. That has a V independent term and a term that's linear in V. So when you do, do the iteration, right, there's a T and then at, at each stage you can choose, do you choose the R or do you choose the VT when you expand this to the power N? And there will be one term where you always choose VT and that's the bad term. Okay, so that's the term which is T times VT to the N. It's a very explicit formula for the additional term. The special structure term comes now, so let's look at this. So this is the term we have. This is the term we extracted, that's the additional term. And now the difference you can write as an n-fold integral. And in this integral, you just put in a cutoff function. And the good region is where at least one pair of, of points, subsequent points, is more than epsilon away. Because that's the region where, the, where, you, where you pick up the exponential decay of the Yukawa, the, the Green's function. So that region is exponentially small. So the, the region where all pair, all subsequent pairs are epsilon close to each other, that's the region where we need to get the special structure from. All right, and now I'm essentially at the end of my talk and now I can, um, um, 
tell you where the three-dimensional assumption comes from, it comes from a special integral formula. So let's look, let's think about uh, these terms here. So you think about the additional term, right? Okay, so that's an integral. You have the parametrices and then V and the parametrices. Let me go back how they look like. The um, parametrices, see, the only dependence on lambda is here in the exponential. So when you multiply these exponentials together, it's one big exponential, which is just a square root of lambda times the sum of these distances. And now the magic is that a term of this form, e to the minus square root of lambda delta divided by square root of lambda, this you can write as a Stilchis transform. With a certain function kappa, which is completely explicit, right? Which has some, I mean, it's nice at the origin. So there's a big cancellation going on and it has a one of our squared decays. It's very explicit. And so this formula allows you to write all these parametrics terms together as a single uh, steel choice transform. If we had such a form, I mean, well, let me backtrack. The point here is that in other dimensions, the parametrics or the Green's function is just not an exponential divided by, by a power of x, right? Even if you go, to, so in, in even dimensions, there are some funny logarithms and stuff appearing. But even if you go to five dimensions, it looks like this plus some extra terms. And it's these extra terms that we cannot control. Anyway, so if you do this, you see, uh, you can write uh, the, the, this additional term. And similarly, also the, these terms that you get when, when you, you don't get the, the VT, but the R term in the expansion, you can simply write those as, as one uh, steel chest transform. And in particular, the additional term has this explicit formula. Okay, it's the T terms with lambda equal to zero, alternatingly with Vs, and then the delta times kappa of delta square root of t, where kappa is this special function. Okay, and so using this explicit form for the additional term, one can do all this analysis and finally get the, the main result. And so that's the end of the talk. Let me quickly summarize what I tried to say. I was talking about while law on, on for Schrodinger operators on three-dimensional manifolds. Um, I showed that if the potential V is only Cato class, then we still have the pointwise law with a little o remainder, but that in general, this cannot be improved in the power scale. Also, we gave a sufficient condition which seems very, very close to necessary. See, this term, this stuff is essentially the first term that appears in the additional term. So for that reason, it's very, very close to, to necessary. And this condition, so gives you a capital O of lambda remainder. And the way we proved this was by really going back at the papers of our Kumovich from 1952 and 1956, um, where he used the resolvent far away from the spectrum plus a powerful Tiberian theorem. And this is very useful when you have rough potentials. You don't have to worry about oscillations. You can really concentrate on the singularities. And you have the exponential decay that helps you far away. As I mentioned, it's an open problem whether this method can be extended to higher dimensions. The one and only place where we use the three-dimensionality is in this formula where we write the, the, the iterated parametrics as a single steel chest transform. Um, another problem that I think would be interesting to recover and actually to extend is Seeley's estimate. Seeley proved a capital O of lambda bound in the presence of boundaries. And it would be interesting to see whether one can also get this by these techniques that I've, I've outlined here. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, thanks for inviting me and let me make one more advertisement.
namely on August 12th, we are organizing a birthday conference for Ari Laptev. We're advertising this and it would be great if you would join us. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Rupert, for, uh, for this talk. Um, does uh, anybody have a question? You can either unmute yourself to ask it or ask it in chat. Well, I, right. I have two questions. Um, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, can you have a rough coefficients in front of higher order terms and then get some asymptotics? It's a good question. We have not explored it so far. Um, it, it's certainly a very valid thing. I mean, I, it's, it's not an immediate uh, consequence of what I was telling you, but of course you would hope that you get something. Mm. 